I am responding specifically by giving what I would say a practical impl implementation of what I'm doing at the moment in an attempt at decolonizing the curriculum that I'm currently teaching. A little bit of background is that after 23 years of not teaching first year, I have gone back to teaching first year. Um, it is after 10 years of not teaching with Blackboard, I have gone to teaching with Blackboard. So I am now a junior lecturer. Uh, my, my, my daytime job is to be a junior lecturer in the Department of Town and Regional Planning. I'm doing this as a way of seeing how I can change the way in which our curriculum works. What resonated with me particularly, Caroline, was when you said that people should be given marks for being able to speak another language. People should also be, give, be given additional marks for being able to get themselves from the PAL every morning through traffic and not for, for living in the southern suburbs. There are other things that people achieve on a daily basis that go completely unrecognized. So the model that I take for my teaching is something that I learned very hard last year called Pokemon Go. I don't know who of you are players of Pokemon Go. Not one. <laughs> Pokemon Go is about collecting assets as you go along and then being able to evolve those assets and being able to level yourself up as you get assets. Our cur current basis of teaching is a deficit base. We assume students know nothing, and, when we are, and if they know half of what we taught them, no. If they know, this is how it works. We take a batch of students. We put a batch of knowledge into them, and they become a batch of second years. We then put another batch of knowledge into them. They become a batch of third years. If they pass that, we show that we have batch processed them by walking them across the stage and putting an identical gown, an identical hood, and a black hat on their heads and giving them bachelor's degrees. And the way in which we do those bachelor's degrees is by teaching them less and less and less because we have this thing called reduction of, of content, which means making it less. The way most lecturers do that is when you between the staff room and the classroom, what you remember to teach, that's what you'll be teaching. When it becomes time for the exam, what you remember to ask is what you'll ask. And if the, children, if the students are able to remember half of that, they pass, which means it gets less and less and less, which is why they are called lessons. And the product of that is called morons. So I'm going to take you through a little trick of how I have been trying to make every single thing that a student does for me count. I have no idea what the final mark will be because I don't know what I've taught them yet and I don't actually teach them, they're supposed to learn. Uh, if I teach them, then what will they learn? So if we're lucky, there will be some slides appearing soon. Uh, please tell me that there's going to be a slide appearing soon. Oh, very good, which is halfway there. So I'm going to show you how I've been doing asset-based teaching in my classroom um, as a junior lecturer. And this is my opening screen. Students see this screen about uh, a week before they come to class. It has an Adinka symbol for communication on the top. And they get told that this course, the aim of this course is to make sure that they will pass the other courses. So I've moved it from a language teaching to an academic literacy, campus literacy type of test. The first thing they have are called learning activities, and they have to prepare for those learning activities in advance. What occurs in class is that they will start telling me what they did when they were preparing for those various learning activities. The first learning activity is to watch a little YouTube video clip of two young ladies, one introducing the other, saying, this is my friend Sally, and this is what my friend Sally does. Please welcome my friend Sally. When they come to class, they, they then see me for the first time and one another for approximately the first time. They spend about 20 minutes interviewing one another in whatever language they choose. Uh, and after they've had that interview, they then stand up and they have to introduce one of their colleagues. 
and we then crowdsourced the grade that they will get between 0 and 5. So I put up, I just say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and where the most hands get up, that is the grade that they will obtain for that. If you have 60 students doing that for one minute each, it takes you an hour. I thought it was crashingly boring. The students thought it was absolutely amazing getting to know their colleagues on that first day. That is when I got to know that at least four of my students traveled on a daily basis from Paul. I would not have known that if I hadn't got them to tell me that. We also did a thing about getting to know ourselves. They had to do an online temperament test that said whether they were melancholy, choleric, uh, or whatever else those various temperaments are. Since that is all hogwash anyway, they have to do a little multiple choice test in which they acknowledge that this is just a way of finding a stereotype. The entire lecture is then about stereotypes and stereotyping rather than about temperaments and temperament inventories. I prefer to make them work with as little writing as possible because I think writing is deeply overrated as a communication medium. There are various other things with which one can communicate and so therefore they go online to a website about mind maps. They do a little five mark test about what should be in a mind map and then they get to draw their own mind maps. The mind map rubric that they have has about 50 half points and when they come back to class with their mind maps they get given a, what I call, a peer-assisted self-assessment. So there's the rubric. It looks at absolutely everything. It looks at the color used in the mind map. It looks at whether the lines are wavy. It looks at whether they put themselves in the middle of that mind map and their various subjects on the sides rather than to try and put the subjects in the mind map and so. So I'm trying there to make them visual learners. Here are some examples of their mind maps from which you can see that some of them are technologically quite advanced, um, but they make really bad mind maps when they do them by computer. You make really good mind maps if you do them by hand. In this assessment of their mind maps, it was quite fun to see how they had to negotiate meaning because they sit in front of the computer and they grade their mind. I, gra I sit in front grading myself while the two of you help me on the side. And we negotiate those marks as we go through in whichever language suits us. Um, I have to eventually teach language, but I discovered that if they're, since their school teachers couldn't teach them a language in 13 years, I'm not going to do it in 13 weeks. So I found a really nice online website uh, where they could then do the language, to, uh, go through the website themselves. The website doesn't keep record of what they do, so I had to find some way of extracting the records out of them. This is the rubric of what I taught them. They had to learn grammar, punctuation, organization, style, and technical competencies about creating Word documents. Um, and they had to make a deliver deliverable of the one that you can see there. So this is all the Word competencies. They also had to take a screenshot of the result of their test. They had to tell, and they had to do that test until it get, they get full marks for it. Then only make the screenshot and paste the screenshot into the Word document. There are three ways of doing that. Firstly, you can, okay, I can't tell you that because it's too much of a hurry. Um, we also had to do Human Rights Day. It was a long weekend and I wanted to go away, so I gave them a self-study module where they went onto an Australian website that had a really good thing about human rights based on the UN uh, Human Rights Charter. They also got a, a multiple choice test on the South African Human Rights Charter, which is chapter three of the Constitution, which they did as a comprehension test for me. What else have I got here? Oh, yes. So those were the various assignments. They then also had to walk from the slave museum, which they visited, back to campus. And they had to look at their four subjects that they, had been, uh, that they are studying and see what the human rights implications of those four subjects are. That had to be converted into a PowerPoint done by students in groups of three. And the PowerPoint had to be uploaded. So what you can see there is an example, human rights in relation to urbanization, human rights in relation to infrastructure and planning, etc. They then presented those to one another in class, and again, it was a peer grading assessment that we did. The next one we did was time management. They had to download something about time management. They then had to um, fill out the time sheets. And on the last day, before they had to submit the time sheets, there I found them in the studio quickly printing out timesheets and filling them out retrospectively. This is the mark sheet as it looked about three weeks ago. Uh, the best mark on the, on the screen there you will see 
is about 65 out of about 70, I'm guessing. I'm working on a completely criterion referenced way of marking. So in other words, the ideal is that they must get full marks. So I'm not going to have a normal distribution curve at the end. Students are either going to have very high 80s or fail. And the only way you can really fail is by not submitting anything. The last exercise uh, we had with them currently was when I gave them a final summit of assessment, which is a multiple choice test covering all the work that I've done up to now. And there were 25 questions. They could do it three times. What was really, in, and they could do it from home or from the computer laboratory. And I went in there to just see what was happening. So it was really interesting when they heard that they could do this test three times. Some of them said, okay, well, in that case, I need to make very careful record of what I do when I answer it the first time so that my marks will improve when I do it the second time. And she went through methodically getting this done, which she did. Another group was sitting just a few computers away, and one of them managed to get about 24 for his, uh, um, for his test out of 25. And, he th and then she, he said, I'm going to do it again and I'll get my 25. So he did it again. She then called her friends over and said, hey, come and help me. We can't get him beating me. I'm on 19, then 23, so now I want 25 as well. Come and see if you can spot the things where I had it wrong. And eventually she managed to get her 25. It was then interesting for me to see, and I can see their marks come in because they're working on Blackboard. So as those marks started getting in, so they came and started looking over my shoulder, uh, which eventually meant I had to cover half the screen so that they can't see the names of their, of their colleagues. But eventually I thought it would be quite a good idea just to, to rank the marks in sequence and say who's the best in class. It, it led to really exciting conversations around that. And so what I found really is that the way in which I'm decolonizing my communication curriculum, and I can breathe because I've done my seven, my seven, my 20 slides in 20 seconds, the way in which I believe I'm able to, to decolonize my curriculum is that although there are 60 students in the class, essentially I'm only teaching one, and that is the one sitting between your two ears. And it is your job to see what you can do to do better with the resources that I make available to you. And so in the feedback forms that I get, at the end of every lecture, I give them a, a thing called a PMI, plus minus interesting. They have to tell me what they regarded as positive, what they regarded as negative, and what they regarded as interesting. And also what they think I would find interesting. And that's been amazing to see what students would like to share with the lecturer. One of the things that makes it interesting if the dean goes to become a junior lecturer in his faculty is what you learn about teaching and learning in your faculty. Because one of the students on feedback session five under positive said, I really like the way Mr. Cronier teaches. He is never late. I thought if at lecture five a student is pleased that there is a lecturer who is never late, it's not what he's saying about me, it's what he's saying about the rest of them. So we had some conversations about that. So ladies and gentlemen, that's just briefly the way in which I've been trying to make a learner-centered basis where I don't actually teach at all. I appear in class and I watch the students learn. Questions, comments? There is a question. Okay. Molweni. Um Dingu Pamela Maseko and Sukai wrote. Um Okokala and the Bulela uh Ifundani Abakokuzeli Balen Tangano into Babakwazi Uku um Ukwenza Lendos Lagu Teta Ka Singayenzi. Um, uku fumana abandabaza uku kula, uh, uku fumana abandu uh, for e sign language, ndiabulela kakulu uh, theo nabanye abandabasa veza na.
Diabona kutake kile pa kufulu kutoli kile tati eva tati. Eva. I, I do understand the <laughs> translation. I understand dia vuya, so I know that you are very happy. <laughs> okay. I'm not altogether sure what you're very happy uh, about, but the translator okay. has been telling me. Um, language. Sitata ng language is a means of communication. Um zege sitete ge goku teta ka um uruz ka e teta nge language is a problem, um Caroline. Uye a ati tele ati i language is not only should not only be perceived as a right. Um uti ma kuki telo i language is a genus as a resource. Okay, um, and therefore, Caroline Nawe, um, Tata Kronye, this the Telukubuza in Dokuba in a second is one Janina in language. No Kuba will fund and guessing, yes, Okanying is it closer now, Okanying is new him. Ukufumana in Ram Nengeko Yabandu Abateta Ilum is a sint. Mandi to Lig and Obam Shambi and Danabutolka and the Guvaput. Godwa, the Funuguti. As it teta, when, when we speak about language, we're not only talking about it as a means of communication. Okay? So even when we use it in a classroom um, a, uh, for teaching and learning, there's something more that we need to do to value the people speaking these languages. Ukerolin utekai tetai wati decoloniality means making visible those things that have been invisibilized. And therefore, how can you teach e engineering? Okay? Usebenzi se e techniques zo kwaka ze sint as a second is a pam go baku fike ubu kolonial. Unga seven zanjani na unga fundi sanjana ingeko ya kwantu malunga no gulima i agrarian strategies um the sint. Unga seven zanjani na um ku architecture ku design uku chonga inle la yoku kola i carving ebesi seven sa i angles and all that ebesi seven sa pambi koko ba kufike. Um, ubu colonial. So, na the coloniality, uma feje uti. It's not only um, about e language, uba utete. It's also about ideas in the language. It's also about the knowledge embedded in the language. Because kan the teta, the teta is closer. The teta is singes. God wa kui singes and the teta andi ngum closer. Kuno bu closer. No kupandis. If I write, um, if I say she is speaking, sukundi sleka yazi ingi koyam yesklosa indokuba and distinguish each gender. So the teluku uku uku ti kasi teta ngezi ndo singa teti only ngen dokuba si teta is closer. Um 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 uzwe sbini di ten nemi buzwe mi bini ne. Um, I mandu yek. Okay, I, I really like what you're saying. The subject that I'm dealing with, or the group to whom I am teaching this communication thing that I'm teaching, is uh, the group of town and regional planning students. And what we have to realize about town and regional planning is there's a lot of legislation and mathematics that need, and geography uh, that needs to go into that. But the majority of their work will be done within communities. And so the majority of work that a town and regional planner does, he does with his eyes and his ears and his mouth because he consults with communities about delivering a better place for them in which to live. And that's why I focus in my teaching of the students 
in, on multi-resource work, and, and language is but one of the resources, and English is but one of those language resources that they have. There's also the thing called internet. There's also, um, we, we, do, we look at body language, we look at various other things. So I'm trying, what I'm really trying to make the students able to do is to be information literate and, and able to find, process, and communicate with a multiplicity of resources. So that the, the language, whether it be English, Afrikaans, or body language, is, is the tool rather than that which I am teaching. Ethics in social media. And, the, and you know, because that's something I've been quite um, worried about yeah. in, in terms of exposing students to, in terms of using social media and the ethics. And it's it's certainly something that that will be built into the curriculum. I'm 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 halfway through it at this stage, but there is a lecture that I have, which is based on a combination of YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. The lecture is called You Twit Face, and uh, it is just about the ethics of communication with one another. Uh, one of the things that uh, students WhatsApp me, students WhatsApp one another. We also need to understand that WhatsApp spelling and, and SMS spelling is a valid language of its own. It's not just kids who can't write English. Um, and, and there are styles of communicating. What one really needs to start knowing is that th there's no way on this green earth that certain images should be shared on WhatsApp. And students get disciplined if they, do, if they share certain images on WhatsApp. Um, so th the whole, the fact that, that uh, I have a number of master's students currently doing their research on exactly what sort of academic communication is happening through the WhatsApp channel at the moment. And, and yes, that, that's, that's how we communicate and that's how a lot of learning happens. There was a question there. Hi, thank you. That was highly entertaining and very informative. Um, I just, it just struck me that uh, which again says more about me than you, um, is that to teach in that way, you're really a free spirit and you're able to give up control. And a lot of us lecturers, <laughs> we think we're happy to give up control and have interactive classes. But listening to you, I realized, you know, I got quite anxious. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to, to take that, yeah, it's because we seem to be so stuck on marks and, and on maybe students will cheat for a mark. I'm fine if they cheat. That's what the world is about. It's about building your portfolio of skills. And, and if there's no way on this green earth that a student is going to get the same friend to do every assignment for a whole year. And if he does get somebody else to do every single assignment for him for his entire life, then what do we call him? A chief executive officer. <laughs>